This is Ruthie Jackson welcoming you to our 250th taping of It Happened in Grand Prairie. And this is a wonderful history show where we document the history of our city. And some of these people are still making history. We're very privileged today on this May the 30th to bring to you our Memorial Day history tape. And we have two young men that have uh, logged lots of time in the service. And we're very pleased to welcome uh, to the set today, first of all, Mr. Joe Taft. Mr. Joe, welcome to the set, young man. Glad to be here. Oh, we're just so pleased to have you on the set today, and we're going to get with you in just a few minutes. Thank and Mr. You. Bob Shanks, welcome back to the set. Thank you. We've done an interview personally with Mr. Shanks earlier on in our history tapes, but he's joined us today for a very special Memorial Day segment that not only has to do with Memorial Day, but has to do with a very special site in our city, and we're going to get to that in a few minutes. Before we do that, let's do a little short interview with uh, Mr. Joe Taft. And Mr. Joe, you have an exciting name in that Taft is T-A-A-F-F-E. Right. Uh, we were impressed with the spelling of that, and we want you to tell us a little bit about the real Joe Taft. Look out into your camera and tell us about, uh, about your history. When you were born, where you were oh, born. I was born in, well, it's now Grand Prairie, but at that time I was out in the country, oh. south of town. About Florence Hill area? Florence Hill. Yes. Born January 14, 1915. All right, and name us your parents. My father's name was Joseph Clyde. All right. And he was senior. My mother was named Margaret Ada. Everybody called her Maggie. All right, and what was her maiden name? O'Donnell. O'Donnell. All right, that's yeah. wonderful. Did you have brothers or sisters? I had one sister, just Margaret. Just Margaret. Margaret Taft, beautiful, beautiful young lady okay. that was a gopher also. Right. Uh, did you attend school at Florence Hill first? Went to Florence Hill the first nine grades. All right. And then we were integrated into the Grand Prairie High School. All right. And I finished the last two years in Grand Prairie. And your graduating year was? 1931. 1931, that was the magic year then. Mm -hmm. And as a gopher, uh, tell me a little bit about your school at Grand Prairie High School, your schooling. Uh, did you have favorite teachers? Who was the superintendent? Or do you remember any of that good stuff? Well, Mrs. Lola Mae Miller, uh, she was later Miss Lola Mae Hall, I believe. All right. She was my home. Homeroom room, teacher? Homeroom teacher. All right. Mm -hmm. And the superintendent was Mr. C.B. Gentry. C.B. Gentry, all right. Uh, and, did you ex and, and, uh I didn't do any uh, athletics because uh, we were bust up to town. Yes, uh-huh. So we had to leave after school to get home. What was your favorite subjects? I liked history better than anything else, I believe. Well, I like history better than anything yeah. else. American history especially. All right. And but, uh, after leaving Grand Prairie High School, what happened to Mr. Joe? Well, right during the Depression had started. Had very little money on the farm. and. Uh, I didn't have the money to go to college. My daddy wanted me to help him with the farm, so that's what I did for about three years. All right. But uh, the only thing I ever wanted to do was fly. All right. So uh, in 1935, my parents, they were dead set against me flying, but uh, I wasn't going to be happy unless I did. So I uh, didn't have any money, but I had an insurance policy. Yes. That I had about $92 cash value in it. So I borrowed every nickel of that. <clears throat> I went up to the airport and paid the $75 for 10 hours of flying time. And where was this airport? At Grand Prairie Airport. Grand Prairie Airport. What was it called then? That was, it was called, uh, I believe, Grand Prairie Airport at that time. All right. Because Curtis Wright had ceased operating at that time. All right, so you went up there after it was Curtis Wright and when it was Grand Prairie Airport. And this was in 35. 1935, all right. Latter part. And you did learn to fly. Yeah, bought my 10 hours and uh, had to buy physical, cost me $10. All right. And that left me about $7. And you had to do something when you soloed, mm -hmm. special to the instructor and anybody else around the airport. So uh, they said I had to buy everybody a steak dinner. 
course, you could buy a steak dinner for about a dollar, a dollar and a quarter. Half, yeah, you bet. So I, that's where the rest of the seven dollars went. All right. <laughs> you celebrated with a steak dinner. Yeah, that's my solo. All right, and then uh, from that, your flying career took you uh, many places all over the world, didn't it? Yes, it did. Mm -hmm. uh, about the last 20 years of my commercial flying was uh, at the international level. All right. About, about 10 years of that, uh, we were flying to Vietnam all the time. All right. So I used to average one or two trips a month to Saigon there for about 10 years. And then we had charter flights all over the world practically, you especially are, to Europe and you, South America. All right, in the European theater, where did you fly? Well, this was uh, this was when I was a civilian. Yes. Uh, well, most of the year, uh, Frankfurt, Germany, we had a contract to fly there for about a year. And then we'd uh, fly to various places, to Munich and uh, Madrid and, of course, uh, two or three different places in England, Preswick, Scotland, London, Manchester, Belgium, just about mm -hmm. all of Europe. Were you bringing the boys home from no, the we war? No, we were mostly in air freight. Air freight? Okay. But we did have a few, a couple of airplanes that we did do passenger work in. That was mostly for troop carrying, you know. Yes. When they would uh, rotate back home and going over. And all of the time you were doing this, uh, you were living all over the world. You were, did not have a home base at that time? Yes, I was, uh, in 1957, the company, well, I'll start back uh, after the World War II. Yes. My uh, wealthy oil man in San Antonio named Earl Slick, he thought there was a future in uh, air freight business. So he bought uh, 10 surplus airplanes and uh, started the air freight company. Yes. There's only about two or three of them in the United States at that time. And uh, I went to work for him and uh, his company in June of 46. You know, I was based a year in San Francisco. And then I transferred to Chicago to get upgraded as captain. And then we opened up a small base here in Dallas in 1957. So I wanted to get back home. So I thought, well, here's the time to do it. So I bid uh, back to Dallas. We only had about four or five crews here. And then uh, they ceased uh, domestic air freight for a while because it was very difficult to make a profit in air freight alone. Yes. So then we got into the, that's when we got into the uh, military contract work. They would contract uh, a lot of their flying out to uh, civilian companies. And uh, that's when uh, we started flying. That's when my international flying really started back in the mid 50s. I, I, would, I would enjoy hearing about the different airplanes that he started flying and what he wound up with by just name off the different... Yeah, name of some uh, of the aircraft that you've flown, uh, uh, but beginning with the one that when you were a student pilot oh, at the Mercy. Grand Prairie Airport. I can't remember them all. I know it was a, what we call a C-3 Aronica. It was a little two-seater side-by-side. And then I graduated up to uh, Curtis Robin. It was a three-place high wing monoplane. Yes. Had an old OX-5 engine in it. That was uh, World War I vintage just about, but there were a lot of, they were available and a lot of them were put in those airplanes. And, oh, let's see, then I flew that and then I flew an OX-5 Commander. It was a biplane. And uh, then, uh, through the JC, J3 Cub in uh, the primary training program that Blue Foot had. And then we got advanced to a 
what we call secondary training, and that was mostly aerobatics. It was a biplane we used, one of them was called a Myers. And then after I went into service, well, I, I flew everything from the, well, uh, DT-17s. That was a Air Corps trainer. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and when I do all during the Army career, Air Corps career, I flew a lot of different aircraft because I was in the Ferry Command. Really. Yes. And then after the war, while well, we had the C-46 we used, which I'd flown extensively in the Air Force. And then we went to DC-4s, DC-6s. Then we flew uh, Lockheed Constellations. That's a four-engine airplane with a, identified by a triple tail that had yes. designed by Howard Hughes. Yes. And then I finally wound up uh, flying DC 8s jet. Yes. So uh, it you was, graduated after that, then, right? <laughs> <laughs> That's uh, that was uh, how I ended up my career on the flying the Douglas DC 8 jet engine jet airplane. How many hours would you say that you have logged flying, both commercially and otherwise, all of your career? Well, that's, Bob says it's about 29 plus. About 29 plus? Thousand, that is. 29,000 hours yeah. plus. Uh, don't, you th don't you think that we ought to get him some kind of gold wings or something like that? I, d I do. Mr. Shanks? I sure do. That's wonderful. Uh, well, a lot of people have more than that now. All right, we're going to get back with you in just a minute, but let's talk just a minute to Mr. Bob. Mr. Bob, recently in the Grand Prix News, you had a nice write-up about um, your service as a POW. Would you like to add something to this memorial tape that we're having on Memorial Day uh, about your career? Only that I'm just very happy that I'm still alive, and I'm in good health, and I'm very happy. And how many years did you spend in the uh, prisoner of war camp? I, I spent... Uh, about five months. Five from months. December 14th, 1944 to May 4, 1945. Yes, and, and um, in Burma? In Rangoon, Burma. Yes. Some, yes. So, southern tip of Burma. Southern yeah. tip of Burma. Mm -hmm. oh. mm -hmm. That was some experience for a young man of it, your age at it, that time. Were it, you a second was. lieutenant then? No, I was a captain. You were a captain no. then? No. Mm -hmm. yes. no. One thing Bob never did learn was not to volunteer for anything. I see. Uh -huh. he, he never did learn not to volunteer. When he volunteered, then... He uh, got in trouble. It, it, yeah, took, it my, took him right on through trouble. And Yeah, my crew members, there's, there's 10 in the crew, 11 in the crew, counting the pilot. And they always told me that, says, Captain, when you, when you volunteer, you, you volunteer in us, too. <laughs> yes, that is true. Uh, no, not just yourself, but yeah. the entire crew of 11. Yeah. What, did, what did you fly, Mr. Bob? Uh, B-29s. B-29s, the big boy. We took the first B-29s overseas in the early part of 1944. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and we bombed, our group bombed Japan in June of 1944. Yes. Now that was the first time that they had been hit after Doolittle hit them off the off their carrier. Yes. And uh, and it was quite an exciting mission. Yes, mm -hmm. I bet it was too. And uh, where was your plane shot down? Uh, we were we were shot down uh, over Rangoon, Burma. Rangoon, Burma. In fact, there were there were five of us that were shot down. Mm -hmm. Really, actually, we weren't shot down. We had one of our own bombs explode. And under our formation, yes. and they knocked five of us down. And uh, what they were doing, they were mixing uh, thousand pounders and five hundred pounders, and you get a different trajectory. They were just trying this out, and uh, you get a different trajectory, and two of them collided in another formation. I see. We had uh, one of them burn, went down in a ball of fire, uh, spinning, flat spin, and they were and. We were on fire, but we got away by 50 miles. No, I beg, beg your pardon, about 100, about 100 miles. And we were about 10 days getting back into Rangoon. Rangoon was the, the place that uh, was a headquarters for the Japanese Air Force. 
in, in that particular area. In that area of that area. combat. All right, where did you start your flying career? I'm interested to tie you in with uh, Brother uh, Joe here. I, I, was, I started in Arlington and at the college, and they had a CPT program. And uh, then after that, they had Now, a, CPT is what for those in the viewing audience? Civilian Pilot Training Program. Civilian <laughs> Pilot <laughs> Training Program. All right, they had it at Arlington College. I'm glad you remembered that. All right. <laughs> and, and then they had a... Then they had an advanced program and, and up here at the, at the Lou, Lou Futz, and that's where June uh, came together. He was my instructor. Uh huh. And June, so, and, and this is Joe Taft Jr. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Jr. Uh, Why do you call him June? Well, that's his nickname. That's I never, his nickname. I never did know his name was Joe till two or three years ago. Oh, I see. But and you always called him June. Uh, yeah, we, we walked Everybody together did. About, yeah. for about 15 years up the mall. Yes. And uh, we have quite extensive uh, mm -hmm. conversations. And you met, did you meet him at the Arlington College or up here at the uh, Lou Foote's no, Flying Circle? No, Lou Foote, Lou Foote. We had known one another, you know, prior to that. Yeah. All right. We used to hang around Luton's and... Miller Drug. Miller yeah. Drug yeah. and yeah. all that All those, all right. Yeah. And uh, he taught you your first flying then? Yeah. No, yeah. it was secondary. So, we secondary. All right. He took his, uh, if I remember right, you took your primary in, training in Fort Worth, Meacham Field. Yeah. And uh, this was secondary. And, and then he came to you? Well, I was, uh, <coughs> he was assigned to me in mm -hmm. the class. And he and. Uh, was he a pretty good student? If I remember right, he was. <laughs> All right. Uh, Mr. Bob, what, what kind what of... else can he say? Yeah, Mr. Bob, what kind of uh, plane did you train in for secondary? Uh, this, uh, this is a Myers. Uh, that's the one I mentioned yeah. a while ago. Yes. Is it, a is it twin... Biplane. Biplane. Uh-huh. And, and they taught aerobatics and uh -huh. the, the rolls mm -hmm. and the loops. And, and after you got your advanced, what happened to you, Mr. Bob? Uh, I joined the Royal Canadian Air Force. They were asking for, for pilots, and yes. uh, there were many Americans went up there. Yes. And uh, so they notified me that I was to go, and and I was about 19. And so I went over to Love Field and boarded the DC-3 sleeper. You ever hear of a, a sleeper? Never heard of that. And, and it was. It went first class, then went to New York, and and we stayed. They put us up at the Waldorf. At that time, then we My. traveled by a plane into Montreal, mm -hmm. and then they checked us out there, and and then got a commission, direct commission, as the uh, same same as second lieutenant, mm -hmm. flying officer. Mm -hmm. And you flew with the the Canadian Air Force how for, long? For about uh, just about a year, All and right. then they then the the government transferred us back to the United States. I see. And then, after after we entered the World War II, uh, <coughs> Canadians uh, would uh, let them transfer back to the Air Corps, U.S. Yes. Army Air Corps. Mm -hmm. And uh, when you transferred back from Montreal back here to the United States, where you, were you based? The San Antonio, in at, San at Brooksville, Antonio. San Antonio. All right. And, and Lisa and I were married there on the base in Canada. And, uh, in Canada. So, so she traveled. She traveled with me. Uh -huh. And your dear wife, Letha, you lost her several about, years about ago. About five years ago. Yes. About five years ago. With yes. Mm -hmm. And I sure miss her. Yes, you do. Yes, you do. All right. Now, Mr. Joe. Well, now we, we want to. Before we stop on that. All right. You were later transferred to Tarrant Field. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. yeah. Let's tell yeah. about that. Oh yeah. I was. Him tell I was a B-24 instructor, and that before I went overseas and. At Tarrant Field, well, Carswell now. What is now and, Carswell? Yeah, instructing on B 24s. Mm -hmm. And then that's where I got promoted to a captain in March of 43. All right. Mm. Did you feel responsible for all of this career that he has <laughs> accumulated, Mr. Joe? <laughs> well, or did you keep in touch with him all of these years? Well, I lost contact with him there for a long while. Yes. But he was uh, there at Tarrant Field playing golf, all that stuff. They came along and asked for volunteers to go to school for the B-29s. They were just being yes. built. 
Aha. Uh -huh. So he volunteered for that, if I remember correctly. Yeah, and we, we that's about the second or third <laughs> volunteering he's been doing, uh, isn't a, it? That's why I say he never learned not to volunteer. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> you you got to know when to keep your mouth shut. <laughs> he volunteered for the Royal Canadian Air Force. <laughs> and he volunteered for the B-29s. And uh, that's where he almost met his Waterloo there. All right, and in the B-29s, where did you train for that? Uh, trained in Pratt, Kansas. Pratt, Kansas. They had four bases in Kansas, mm -hmm. and we were in Pratt. Mm -hmm. And uh, then we took the first ones over to India. And then we worked out of India, and also then flew the hump across into China, the western China, uh, with fly missions on Shanghai and Manchuria and mm -hmm. bases like that. Uh, and then later into Japan. We're going to ask you a very pointed question, Mr. Shanks. Uh, you have his hours logged at 29,000 plus. How many do you have? I have about 2,800. 2,800, okay. You, uh, could yeah. make, you could round that off to 2,900. <laughs> yeah, and just take off the zero. 3,000 would be all right. Yeah, <laughs> yes. Well, that's considerably less, but uh, but yeah, probably yeah. not mo any more exciting than but, some but, of the things you've done. But I quit. Done. I quit, Ruth, in uh, in 1945, uh -huh. 1946. Mm -hmm. uh, I didn't fly anymore. After after coming back from Burma, yes. you thought that was enough. Yeah. You had volunteered enough. I was yeah. pleased. <laughs> you volunteered to come home. Yes. <laughs> All right. I want to uh, get back with Mr. Joe yeah, a little bit more about this flying field that is located immediately west of what we now call Nations Bank. That's right. On the airport freeway, uh, what was the very first flying field at all that was there in the very beginning, when that first became a Grand Prairie Airport or uh, well, served Grand Prairie? Originally, it was Curtis Wright bought the property there. I don't know who owned it. All right. This was in the late 20s. Late 20s. And I believe the hangar was finished in 1929, if I'm not sure, if I remember correctly. And it was Curtis Wright what? It's flying service. Flying service. Now, we have a, we have a photograph here that uh, Randy Souders has done, was commissioned by the Republic Bank to do a, his concept of that. And of course, there are some of the things on that are, that are strictly his concept, like the viewing stands on the, on the north of that. But mm -hmm. that is a semblance of what the the old hangar looked like, except he has the wrong name on it, doesn't right. he? Right. Yes. Uh, it was primarily a flying school. But yes. But they did other things besides that. <clears throat> they had aircraft sales. All right. The Curtis Division, they were into the aircraft manufacturing, and the Wright Division was in the engine All right. manufacturing. And they, uh, Wright, they developed a very good nine-cylinder radial engine called a right whirlwind, I believe they called it. Tell Ruthie what you did after your after your money ran out. How do you, oh, how do you yeah, continue well, to fly? I'll, I'll get to that okay. in a second. <laughs> <laughs> if she cares to listen. Yeah, uh, we're anyway, going to keep going a few more minutes. But anyway, the, uh, the right, they had a very good engine. It was a, one of them was called the Wright J5 whirlwind. And that was the engine that Lindbergh used in his airplane. Yes, when he flew Spirit of St. Louis. Very dependable engine. Yes. And then the Wrights, they had aircraft. They had uh, one was a little two-place pusher type called uh, Curtis Jr. And then they had uh, Curtis Fledgling. It was a rather big boxy biplane that they used for their training. Yes. And then they had the passenger airplane I mentioned before, the Curtis Robin. It was a three-place. And then they built, a little bit later, they built a, what we call a Curtis Thrush. Seemed like all the airplanes, they named that the Birds. Yes, <laughs> yes. And it was, a, it was a, a little larger. And then uh, a little bit later, they built a big biplane, twin engine, called a Curtis Condor. I guess it carried about 12 or 15 passengers. They built it for the airline industry, which yes. was just getting started then. But the Ford Tri-Motor was much popular, so it never, the Curtis Condor never, they never made too many of them. Okay, and after mm -hmm. that was Curtis Wright Flying Service, mm -hmm. then what, that closed down because they went into bankruptcy, then what happened? Yes, uh, along in the late, early 30s, they, uh, 
you know, uh, depression was here and they, people didn't have the money to fly and buy airplanes, so they just phased out their operation there. And uh, two or three years, uh, I'm a little vague about what happened, but it seemed like about 1934, uh, oh, the name of Mr. Kirk, R.C. Kirk, he took over the airport there. Okay. And uh, in the meantime, well, let's see, I just started flying. And in January of 36, he got killed. And he was, had a charter flight to Victoria, Texas. I never will forget it. They were building a big school down there, and he had the builder and his architecture along. And they wanted to go down and back that weekend. But uh, they had some fog and low ceilings down around Itasca. And uh, he wasn't instrument rated, and his airplane wasn't either. <laughs> Yes. So he was trying to stay in contact with the ground and, and uh, just flew into a slight rise in the terrain there and, of course, killed them all three. That was in the latter part of January of 35. And then I, uh, the instructor there was named Max Parkinson. I, I think I mentioned that he was. Yes. Well, he, Mrs. Kirk. Kirk Widow, she tried to operate the airport for several months, and she hired me to help the Max Parkinson to, uh, around the airport, and she gave me a little flying time every week in one of her airplanes. She, they had two airplanes, Mr. Kirk did. And, uh, and another airplane I took care of for a party out of Dallas. They let me fly it for about 30 or 40 minutes a week. Wonderful. <laughs> so it wasn't much time, but... Every little bit helped. It came, it came pretty slow in those days. And then after, after the Kirks then, when they went out of business, who was next? Is that when Lou Foote came in? No, not, not yet. Not yet. Uh, we have just two minutes left on our interview, so, oh, right? so we, I want you to name some of the other owners after no, the Mr. Kirks. Mr. Harmon bought it in uh, 1938. All right. And uh, he had a stroke and was physically handicapped. And in 1939, he sold it to Lou Foote. All right. And that's uh, the owner until uh, the Navy took it over. So the Navy took it over and made it an auxiliary field for what? For primary training. Primary training. Mm -hmm. And was that all during the war they used that as a site for primary training? Uh, to my knowledge, mm -hmm. I left here in 41. And uh, that was the end of my tenure at the old Grand Prairie Airport. But I well, still have a lot of fond memories. Yes. Well, I want to thank you all for bringing us up to date on the airport, the, the service on uh, freeway, airport freeway, also as a memorial salute to both of you all for giving so much. And I want to thank you, Bobby, for getting Mr. You, Joe Richard. out of the training field out at the mall and getting him on this show. And we're going to have to do this again and bring you more information. Yeah. And this is Ruthie Jackson reminding you that history is as we live and do. Thank you all very much. Thank you for having me.